so ultimately man is taught in philosophy. And a nation of people that hasn't got any thought pattern by which it can be identified is non-existent. And to the extent the black man remained for many years without presenting anything as representing his own thought pattern, he was regarded as non-existent in the committee of human races. But we have now come to offer to everyone of you, Gordians, as our own contribution to the diversification and enrichment of the totality of human culture. Over the years, we have remained borrowers economically. We are beggars, we are borrowers. Technologically, we are beggars, we are borrowers. Ideologically, we are beggars, we are borrowers. In religious philosophy, the black man is a beggar, he is a borrower. And naturally, he who goes at borrowing, goes at sorrowing. You can never claim equality with the people from whom you very much borrow. That is the reason why we are presenting to all of you Gordianism and asking you to rally around it as an umbrella to which you will come together when the interest of the black man is at stake. We are the only race in the world that hasn't got any ism under whose umbrella we can rally when the interest of the black man is at stake. The Jews rally to Judaism and under the banner of Judaism they fight for that, for the interest of the Jews. The Mohammedans, I mean the Arabs, when the interest of the Arabs is at stake, then they rally to Mohammedans and use it as an instrument for fighting the cause of the Arab world. And when the Europeans have their interest at stake, they run to the umbrella of Christianism and then put up the cross of Christ and sing. Onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Then they sing that war song under the banner of Christianism and then go to fight the cause of the European world. But the black man hasn't got that. That is a tragedy. But we have come now to offer you Gordianism as an umbrella to which you can rally to fight the cause of the black man when our interest is in jeopardy. And you know we have, in every ton of human interaction, the interest of the black man in jeopardy. And having, unless we have this, unite ourselves under a banner, it will not be possible for the black man to make an impression for which he will be respected anywhere on earth. Because it is not easy for people to get united unless you are united in a common ideology. We may be different in language culture. We may be different in geographical dispersions around the world. We may be different in every manner of uh, uh, appearance. But if we can be able to have one core thought pattern, one core ideology holding us together, then it would be easy for us to achieve very greatness because it is said under the dominion of an idea which possesses the mind of a people. The nation soon confounds the arithmetic of the mathematician and achieves a success out of all proportion to that means like the Saracens had done in history. It becomes necessary that if the black man must have to come up, fight for his cause, and then with that cause, we must have to achieve unity under a banner of a religion, which is the foundation of human behavior. And that unity, that banner, is Gordianism. That is what we have been going to all the world to present. And I'm asking you people, as I have seen you, my brothers and sisters, to come and rally around the Gordian religion because Unless we are able to go and make a contribution, we cannot be equal to other people. It is a tragedy that we go and belong to organizations, religious organizations, who don't regard us as slaves. Christianity defends the devil black. Islam does not regard you as equal. They are. And there is 
is no reason why we will continue to serve in organizations that has no respect for us. Will we continue to remain in an organization that represents us as the very incarnate of devil? Painted black. So we really need to think again. Because the problem of the black man is the problem of lack of courage for cultural freedom. We have got political freedom everywhere. We are struggling for economic freedom. And those of you in Africa, in, in, in America, many of you are very economically well placed. We might say you have achieved economic freedom. But what the black world has not been able to achieve is cultural freedom. We continue to remain glorified servants in the cultural vineyard of other races. You may be a bishop in Christianity. You may be um, uh, whatever you may call yourself in Islam. But they do not regard you as anybody serious. They regard you nothing, not more than glorified servants in the cultural vineyard of Europe's Christianity and Arab's Islam. When I read about many of our African-American brothers who took into Islam here in America and then become Muslims, I begin to wonder. I read a new encyclopedia which was published here in America. I read there and they were trying to talk about the population of Muslims in America. I think they said that there are not more than 10,000 Muslims in America and that among them are African Americans. And that the African Americans are not regarded even as true Muslims. And I said to myself, here are African Americans running away from discriminations in Christianity and seeking to run away to something else they could call their own, made the mistake of going to Islam. Because Islam is not an African country. I mean, it's not an African traditional religion. Islam is from Arabia. And Arabia is not from Africa. What the African American needs is what will give him spiritual link with the land of his ancestors. And we feel that it is only a synthesis from African traditional religion that can give you the spiritual link you seek with the land of your ancestors. And that is what Dorianism has come to offer you. I spoke to a number of bishops in Nigeria when the University of Nigeria held a, a, a meeting and they wanted a symposium and they wanted to talk about evil traditional religion and Christianity, the future of both of them. All the bishops, evil bishops, gathered at the university. And then Sir Francis Ibian, a former governor of Eastern Nigeria, he was the chairman of the occasion. And when I presented my paper, I told them whether you like it or not. All of you are bishops with your crimson robes and caps. You are no bigger than glorified servants in the cultural vineyard of Europe's Christianity. And a time is going to come when the black man shall achieve such degree of self-realization that he would not consider his being a member of Christianity safe. And I said, and that is going to be what will happen. One day, all of you as African Americans will not, will achieve such real self-realization that you will no longer accept to become members, to stay members of a religious organization that holds you up as the very epitome of the devil and paints the devil black. This has been happening in Africa. Until 1962, I wrote a letter to Pope John the 23rd in my capacity as the spiritual head of the Italian religion. And then I told him, I canonize some Africans because anywhere you see, the, all the inmates of heaven, they are white. God is painted white. Angels are white. Michael is white. Jesus is white, Mary is white, and Ananias is black. All the criminal characters of the Bible are black. 
Then I wrote to the Pope in 1962. I said to him, I have canonized our own saints. I canonized Mbono Jike, who was a Nigerian nationalist leader, and who was very serious. We called him uh, the boycott, boycott, boycott king. He was the person who introduced the question of uh, the black man coming back to his cultural root and was leaving it in practice, changing the clothing that the white man gave him, a black, I mean, dye and suit. He changed it to African dress and made everybody now go to office with African dress. So we canonized him for that contribution and he became Saint Monotica. Then we looked at Marcus Gap. Here is a person who decided in his revolt against injustice, he felt that the best thing to do is to transport physically the African Americans back to their homes in Africa. But the first effort he made was chaotic. Then that was dropped. And for that, we decided to canonize him because he was making a contribution to the objective of the Bloody religion to give dignity to the black man and restore him, if not physically, but spiritually, to the land of his ancestors. So we canonized him as a saint. Then I wrote to the Pope and said, here we are, we have canonized uh, Bono Jike. He is now Saint Bono Jike. We have canonized Marcos Gavi. He is now Saint Marcos Gavi. These are our own candidates for heaven, so you take note of that. And in my speaking now, you might begin now to change the colors of the inmates of heaven and mix them with black because we are there now. You know, it worked. He was torn to the quick. He felt that nationalism has gone into the field of religion, and if nothing is done in response to our action, we might become so bitter that we will drive Christianity away from that country. And so, in one fell swoop, he had to canonize the 22 Ugandan martyrs who died for the cause of Christianity in Uganda in 1898. But instead of stepping them up smartly into heaven, what they did was that they left them in the purgatory, for the, for in the fridge of the purgatory, so that their skin will be bleached white before they will be considered fit to go and take their seats among the other saints in heaven. And so, because of our action, the Pope in 1963 smartly, in one fell swoop, canonized all the 22 Ugandan martyrs, among whom was Saint Mulumba. So this is how we got that. And later on, too, I came here in 1973, that was the first time I came. My arrival to this place, my coming to America was organized by Dr. Ira Harrison, who is a uh, medical anthropologist of Bihari Medical College. They came to Nigeria and visited me. And I grieved them through our uh, system of uh, socialization. They thought that I should come and send it to African Americans. And so they organized my tour in 1973 April. When I came down, touched down at the airport of Nashville, he had organized some pressmen. Then they asked me, why are you coming here? I said, I have come on a civilizing mission to America to tell the people of America, the, uh, give the people of America the message of a new religious civilization from Africa expressed in philosophical balance as Koreans. And in the Tennessean, they give, gave me a very big back page headline a black man on civil exilizing mission to America. I received publicity. I addressed people in Mihari Medical College, yeah, I mean, uh, Mary, 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 yes, Mihari Medical College, Vanderbilt University, Fisk University, Tennessee State University. Then I came to, oh, I mean, to uh, Michigan here. I addressed people, African Americans, and the university community. I addressed them uh, in Oakland University. And I addressed them also in uh, Michigan State University in East Lansing. Then I went to uh, the Interdenominational Theological Center for the Religious Heritage of the Black World. And after I had addressed, then I received all sorts of publication. In fact, here in uh, Detroit, I was given publicity, interviewed in Detroit News, and I was made to appear 
on television here uh, by Lugogi show. And in fact, he wanted to embarrass me. And that the, uh, the former mayor of uh, Detroit appeared on the same uh, program with me. After he had been interviewed, I was interviewed. And in trying to introduce me, um, Lugogi said, here is the head of African witches. Well, that is what they think of our traditional religion. They think it is witchcraft and nothing more dignifying than that. So I was introduced just to embarrass me, you know, before the television viewers of uh, America. 